<laughs> yeah. So, you know, you've you've been men- mentioning so many things about your reign. What has been the mo the fondest memory of being a Miss Universe title holder? That's hard. I mean, the travel uh, honestly was the best. Um, you know, I got to travel to thirteen countries in twelve months, and I made a lot of friends that I still friends to this day. I saw a lot of like incredible things. I've met incredible people. I, you know, got to stand at the DMZ with people who served where my father served when he was in uh, the army. And I met the princess of Thailand and the president of Peru and Paraguay. And I got to go to, you know, Universal Studios and duct tape my crown to the top of a hard hat. So, um, you know, it was, it was a really fun year. And the only thing I can tell girls when they ask me after they win, you know, do I have any suggestions? I always just tell them, you know, just hold on and say yes to every experience that you can have because it's once in a lifetime and it's such an exclusive club that, you know, it's, you really are privileged. It's rarefied air. And if you get the gig, be grateful because it, it's it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for sure. Uh, yes, th- there's no doubt. I think um, you said in an interview that the most memorable one was the trip to your <laughs> to Korea to the DMC thing yeah, because you couldn't. I mean, Korea was great. Korea was great. It was hectic and a little bit scary um, because people were really ex- enthusiastic to see me. Um, and I had like four bodyguards. It's kind of crazy. Um, but I loved it. It was my first time ever going to Korea. So and I've never been back since, which is weird. But yeah, um, yeah it was it was fun. It was a lot, a lot of fun. Korean people were so proud of me for winning. They really claimed me as their own, which made my whole Korean side of the family just so over the moon. So. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm just, uh, I'm, I was hoping I could get uh, search more about your Korean trip back in the day. So um, looking back at your um, Miss Universe journey, do you think when you, as soon as you set foot in Florida, because the, the pageant is now happening in Florida again, do you think you were already considered a favorite, a heavy favorite for the title as soon as you arrived in the competition? I honestly don't. I don't know. I mean, I think maybe some people probably thought, well, the pageant's in the United States, so they're probably going to put her through because she's in her host country type of a situation. But um, I was just so thrilled to be Miss USA that, you know, it wasn't like I was gunning for anything else. I was just content to be Miss USA and have a good time at Universe. It was a tumultuous uh, time at in Miami. We were supposed to go... I don't know if people know this, but we were supposed to go, I think, to Aruba that year for the Miss Universe pageant. And oh. Mr. Trump actually was the one who was like, no, I don't want to go to Aruba. Miami and Florida is like, that's my town. And, you know, um, Florida is going to open their doors wide because they love me and we're going to have everything in Florida and it's going to be great. And then we got to Florida and Florida was like, we're not paying for anything. <laughs> you're going to have to pay for it all. So, you know, we were staying in like a really crazy downtown district in a walk-up, you know, hotel where if Miss Malta and Miss Italy turned their um, head, their, their hair dryers on at the same time, the whole, the whole hotel shut down, like all of the electricity went off. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was kind of crazy for a little bit. And then when it started getting out in the press that a lot of the girls were like, we're staying in this like crazy hotel that you have to walk upstairs to get to because only three girls could fit in the elevator. Um, when that started to get on the press, they moved us to the Fontainebleau and then, you know, kind of had to do damage control. But when we first got there, it was very, very different um, than how it should have been. And mostly because when you have a pageant, it's usually prepared a year in advance. Like when the girls come to the Philippines, they roll out the red carpet. The girls stay yes. in the most places they're in buses they're you know it's like an olympics whereas when he just pulled the plug and was like no we're gonna go to miami and miami was like we're not paying for any of this you're gonna have to pay for it so the pageant oh. ended up having to pay for a lot of it and so you know things had to be rearranged um so it was a really very strange uh year to be running for sure uh all right see so uh Back then, were you already researching all your <laughs> rivals for the competition? Back then, I know there was no social media then, but how did you try to 
keep yourself confident that okay, I'm gonna try win. I know USA has just won uh, two years ago, but did you try to how what 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 the, what mindset did you have to attract that law of attraction to win? I honestly didn't have a mindset, mostly because I, like I said, I've never really won a pageant before. I don't know what that felt like. Um, so it wasn't like I could replicate it, but I was also working. I was Miss USA. So, you know, from the time I won Miss USA to leaving for Miami um, for Florida, I, I had gone to Toronto for the Special Olympics. I had traveled, you know, in the continental United States quite a bit. I had several different, I had a full agenda besides just, you know, preparing for Miss Universe. I wasn't training. I was on the job. So by the time I got to Miami, I was actually a little bit um, relieved because then I could stop doing my job of being Miss USA and just <laughs> focus on being a contestant. And I didn't, you know, it, it eased it off of me for a little bit. Um, and the only real research I did was they asked me, who do you want to have to be your roommate? Um, you know, because they usually go by what area you're from and then languages that you speak and so because i you know am from hawaii i'm like well i think i want an island girl and you know maybe in the asian community because why not so singapore speaks english they're a british you know affiliate so like just put me with singapore and they're like cool so miss singapore was my uh, roommate trisha tan was her name she was lovely she was a flight attendant from singapore air um and you know we just formed this sort of little group and it was a bunch of us that were hung out together. It was me, her, Miss Korea, um, Miss Taiwan. Um, you know, a bunch of us were all sort of in this little group. And I mean, I hung out with everybody, but you know, like that was that was sort of my hood. Those those were my girls. Yes. As you were going through the competition, did you? Th um, who were? Do you think were the? Who do you think were the strongest? Who were your strongest rivals for the crown? I mean, people always talked about South American countries, of course, um, that they always dominate for sure. I mean, Morena didn't come to play. I mean, she had a different outfit for every hour of the day. Um, so, you know, they come with a big arsenal and a lot of support. And then you had Miss Malta, who, you know, looked like an emo girl from like an East European country who never had ketchup before. Like she was with ketchup, you know, like, <laughs> and wanted to leave. Like she didn't even want to run. She's like, I'm just going to go. I don't want to be here. And I'm like, no, no, Miss Malta, it's cool. We'll, we'll find, we'll find you something. Um, so it really ran the, the spectrum. You know, Miss Italy that year was the first woman of African descent that was representing Italy. So that was kind of a big deal. And so she was getting a lot of harassment uh, by like the Italian community that she didn't like represent them. And so... I remember once we kind of got into a little bit of a, a tussle at an event where an Italian American guy was like, you don't represent me. And I'm like, yeah, I do. You're from the USA. <laughs> You're not from Italy. Take a look at this. Does this look Yankee doodle dandy to you? <laughs> so, you know, um, yeah. So it was like a lot of that kind of a thing. Nafisa, who has since passed away, she was Miss, Miss India. India. She was a lovely, lovely girl um, and very strong um, in competition. So, yeah, there were a lot of strong girls. Puerto Rico was my girl. We hung out. We were two of the oldest that year. Um, so she and I hung out, Miss Virgin, uh, American, U.S. Virgin Islands. She was also our age. So we were sort of the matriarchs because we were sort of on the older end of the spectrum. A lot <laughs> of the girls were a lot younger. So, you know, we, we sort of like sat in the back of the bus and sort of, you know, like traded war stories and stuff like that. It was, yeah. it was a lot of fun. It was a great group of girls. Like the class of 97, just a lot of really great, great girls. M Melanie Winnegar, who was, um, I forget which, Switzerland, I think that year, or Sweet Switzerland. Yeah. We're still yeah. in contact. I, you know, every every country I went to, I tried to visit the girls. To reach that, out, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. for sure. What about Miss Philippines? Did you get to interact with her during the pageant, uh, Abigail Arenas? Abigail, yeah, yeah, for sure. She was part of our little sort of, you know, Asian-like group. Um, she was lovely, beautiful, stunning girl. Um, and she mm -hmm. was lovely, lovely girl. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, because back then, you know, we were so heartbroken about her. Um, we were so disappointed she did not make it because we found out after the pageant that she ran 11th. Oh, wow, the, very close then. So back then, you did not get to see your official scores then, even if you were already yeah. reigning Miss Universe. That's not necessarily true because back then, if you remember, it was a time where they would put the scores up on your on the screen. Oh yeah. 
So you could yeah. get records to it. So you knew which judges hated you. You knew like, you know, but when you're on stage, you don't know because you can't see any of that stuff. But yeah, afterwards, I, I was notorious because after I won USA, I asked the um, the accounting people to please check the scores because I was like, I don't want to get comfortable. <laughs> and that brandy should have won like maybe you guys should just add the numbers i'll stand right here and then i won't get comfortable and they're like we run the numbers several times we get sued otherwise you are the authentic winner we we promise you i'm like okay and then at universe they waited for me to say it again backstage i'm like you sure you guys want to just kind of carry the one and add the thing and they're like we trust me you want trust me <laughs> <laughs> okay sure. Yes, sure you know, cause I'm sure Osmel from Venezuela is going to disagree, but whatever. Okay. Speaking of him, did you know that um, uh, Venezuela, There, were, I think I remember there was a Venezuelan judge in the panel, and yeah. I think she must have scored uh, Macarena. She scored me the lowest, like all day long. That she's a uh, she's a designer, Carolina, Car Carolina Herrera, right? Herrera. Yes, Carolina. How did you know that? Well, later I found out that, you know, when I look back at the scores on the side of the videos and stuff, like, yeah, she was like, she was like constantly lowballing me. But like, that's yeah. the thing that people don't understand, like, that I know because I've judged now is if you really don't want me to win, you don't give me the lowest scores because they knock the high, they knock the low, and you stay in the middle. So if you really want to ding me, you have to just keep me at an average, at a low average. You don't give me very low scores because then it's like you don't exist. They'll just knock your score out. But I mean, I was grateful. I mean, it happened the way it happened, but you know, she was not a fan for sure. Yeah. So wow, I just realized <laughs> that Venezuela. Yeah, I'm, I'm spilling a lot of tea today, Luisa. <laughs> a lot of tea. A lot of tea is being spilled. I just realized now that Venezuelans are really hard, cold competitors. You wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to square up with Venezuela towards the end. No. But then, in the end, you prevailed right so now we go to your styling yeah. at that time then let's face it there were no glam teams stylists to help you with your no, preparation yeah not how did you all. prepare how did you um, get to prepare in terms of picking your gown shoes my, and hairstyle my boss at the time her name was jane babita and she was in charge of Miss Universe and Miss USA and Miss Teen. She would just give you a shopping spree. So I remember much like Pretty Woman, but without the hooker part, um, we would go, she would take the credit card and we would go to Rodeo and we would just walk up and down and we'd go into stores. And I remember going to Fred Heyman's, which was a big store at the time on Beverly Hills um, on Rodeo. And I would go into the, the suite and they would bring in all these dresses, feathers, boas, you know, snakeskin whatever and i get to try all of these things on and then she would pay for them manolo blahniks gucci like it was kind of crazy um and so i got four of those a year uh during my year to you know like a spring wardrobe a winter a competition and then exiting like things you need for when you give up give going to your giving away your title and they bought us everything. So I remember going to malls and having shopping sprees and it was insane. Like I would come back with just bags and bags and bags and bags of suits and dresses and clothes. And, you know, it was, it was the most surreal experience, but my gown, the blue one that people either hate or love, um, was made by a seamstress that worked for the company. She actually, by design, does all of the ice skating outfits for a lot of the uh, Olympic ice skaters. Um, and so we'd gone into Valentino at the time, and I saw a dress in Valentino that had that mesh Ooh. around the there, and it was a white uh, silk charmeuse, and it had that netting, but it was a lot smaller because it's, it's Valentino. They're a, a lot more demure than pageants are. So she saw me in the dress, saw that I liked it, and then she adapted it and actually turned that. That was an ice skating outfit because it's literally what I'm wearing is a bodysuit because it literally like snaps under, you know, to keep the netting the way it is. And then a long skirt that's sewed onto it. So it's technically a ice skating outfit, I guess. <laughs> turned into a gown with a slip. Um, but yeah, so she designed it along with me based on a Valentino dress that I had seen on Rodeo that, you know, she was like, I don't think you should wear white. White's not your color. You know, we should go for a very like, you know, 
vibrant color. And so she brought in swatches and I like the blue. So I picked the blue and then they handed all of the crystals on the bodice. Um, but she designed it with, with my inspiration from our shopping experience, but people either love it or they hated it. Like a lot of people hated that dress, you know? So, but I liked it. I thought it was cool and it was sort of unique and it wasn't like it was one from one of those designers that does all the girls from, you know, the South America or whatever. It was definitely unique for sure. I'm sure a lot of girls yes, because like, what the hell is she wearing? Who <laughs> <laughs> we'll designed that? I'm like, ice skating lady. <laughs> a lady who does ice skating stuff for Michelle Kwan. I'm basically Michelle Kwan. <laughs> But who they who but who uh did you get did you get to pick that kind of hairstyle for yourself? No for actually, the evening of I did not. We did here's the weirdest part of this whole situation in general. Back then it's not like that anymore. Every time Miss Universe and Miss USA rolls into a state, they just get volunteers to do the makeup backstage. There is no chi, there is no Mac, there is no sponsor. Yeah. So it would oh. literally be whoever was like the local, like in, in Shreveport, Louisiana, whoever was the local beauty parlors, yes. they would just call them up and be like, hey, do you want to come do hair and makeup for this pageant? They'll be like, uh, okay, sure. So in Miami, in Florida, it was just randos. I mean, no offense to whoever did my hair. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> 20 something years later. But these are all volunteers backstage from, from Miami. So, and you just got whoever, whoever was available would just grab you and do your thing. So when I'm, when you get called up, right, by the time you get to evening gown, I think, you know, I don't know, no, you haven't been eliminated yet. So by the time you get to evening gown, people are just grabbing you and doing whatever they want. And so I think this gentleman who got me was like, I think I'm going to put your hair up. Are you okay with that? I'm like, do what you want. Like, have at it knock yourself out and so he just twisted it up put it up in bobby pins and out i went <laughs> oh, oh yeah, there was i no thought planning. you had it no now there's a lot of planning that's involved i'm sure people are sort of more you know they sort of like plan things out and you know i'm sure chi hair or whoever the sponsor is like look at all the girls and make decisions but back then it was really a lot more fly by the seat of your pants kind of a thing so so because i you know the, the more you talk about it i'm so glad that it did not affect your condition or performance as you went out on stage to perform like am i really happy with my hairstyle yeah no i mean but again i'm a i'm a i'm a hula gigger by trade i've been dancing in waikiki since i was probably 12 or 13 years old um so i was raised on a stage so i know how to gig i know how to be in front of lights i know how to be on camera i know how to be um at, in a live show so i have muscle memory that i don't worry about things like that because the show has mm -hmm. to go on and i'm i'm like a, i'm a gigger so it's like as soon as i see spotlights i just go into that mode and i'm like showtime you know so it wasn't i wasn't oh. thinking about i wasn't thinking about oh my god there's like a million people watching this oh my god i have to be in a swimsuit i i, I just go into show mode and i just make sure i'm hitting all my spots and all the things we rehearsed and yeah so yes so you know what thank you for sharing all these information you know you were yeah. so you're so generous in spilling these little things you know i feel like you're having i'm having tea with you i did not know that they back then there was a miss universe credit card that they gave you in a budget they gave you a budget for you to shop for your clothes for your wardrobe yeah, in miss i didn't universe. get the credit what? card i just want to be clear i didn't get the credit card the person who ran the company um jane babita she held the credit card but she would take me <laughs> and we would literally walk into bb any storage you'd be like try stuff on and i would try stuff on and she'd just pay for it so i was incredibly lucky the girls don't do that anymore i mean i think i was one of the last that got that kind of generosity after that they started borrowing gowns and getting stylists and borrowing things but i left that pageant with an entire wardrobe of like crazy amounts of clothes and then when i won um, my shopping spree at ball harbor as miss universe you know i went to gucci at ball harbor i you know i went wow. to places like i was incredibly incredibly lucky very fortunate very fortunate yeah did you get to keep all your clothes after your ring yeah i still have a lot of them i have all wow my i have all my fred hand and stuff <coughs> yeah i have them all yeah so when it was down between you and venezuela did you think that the crown will go to you no i mean if you watch back on the clips and you see me like patting her hand and sort of like you know 
calming her down. At that point, I didn't think that if you say you'd eat everything, you'd eat it twice, that that was going to be what's going to be crowned. I honestly just was like, you know, I said what I needed to say. I'm cool. I'm Miss USA. I want a car. I want a boat. I'm cool. So, you know, I didn't think I was going to win because I thought I had thrown it away by saying I would eat everything, but I made a choice. I was like, I'd rather say something and not win than try to go for like, you know, a politically correct answer and then win. Like, I'd rather say what I want to say. So I was really shocked that they would reward me for saying I'd eat everything twice. Um, I did not think it would really go that way, but it did. So I'm, I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful. So having said, having relived all your experience right now in Miss Universe, now let's say if you were to compete at Miss Universe tomorrow, what piece yeah. of advice would you give me? What would you, what, how do I win the crown? How does one, how does a girl win a crown nowadays? based on your you know, experience it's weird a lot of i talk to a lot of girls that run um and i the only thing i ever say to them and i know it's easier said than done is i just tell them that you really need to be in the moment um and you really need to focus on the questions um interview was always my strongest um part of the competition um so i just i like to answer questions i like to listen to people i like to engage so you know don't be so focused on what i look like where are my angles listen to the question that they're asking you and then answer it because you don't it's like a lot of the girls problems have always been i don't know i don't think i have the answer and i'm always like if you breathe on this planet for as long as you have you always have an answer because all people want to hear is your opinion you don't have to give them the right answer. Whatever answer you give is the right answer because it's coming from you. So, you know, that takes a lot of pressure off because a lot of the girls feel like, well, if they ask me about gun control, I don't know what to say. I'm like, say whatever you want to say. It's never going to be wrong, even if you're for it. I mean, even if you're like controversial and you say something that you don't think other people are going to like, as long as you own it, if that's how you feel and that's what you believe, then that's who you are. Don't apologize for it. So it's harder to do. It's easier said than done. But that's what I try to tell all of the girls. And the other thing about pageants that like a lot of people need to realize is pretty girls don't really get asked things a lot. You know, so for me, growing up as a model, it wasn't until I started running in pageants that people asked me my opinion about things. And that's what got me hooked on pageants is because as a model, you just show up, you wear the clothes, you leave. No one cares what you think. No one cares how you feel. Um, so when pageants were like, well, how do you feel about these issues? And I'm like, oh, you're talking to me? You want my opinion on something? Oh my gosh. And I was hooked by that moment on at a local level. I was like, I get to have a voice. People want to ask me what I feel about things. So that really was like, that was my happy thought. Whereas most girls hate the interview competition. They hate the questions. They hate having to answer things. For me, that was my happy place. Getting in a swimsuit, you'd have to trank me and drag me on stage. But I would do interviews all day long. All day long. Yeah. Oh, I think I lost. Hey, did I lose him? Oh, this is where I'm supposed to take over the show, everybody, because his internet crashed. So... Jess, so do you like the new format of Miss Universe and the top five final word and then closing statement? Kind of. I mean, you know, the pageants got to evolve, Jess, so I get where they're going with it. Um, but, you know, the whole eliminating as you go thing kind of like makes it so that you kind of know who's going to win before it happens. It was like a lot better when it was like everybody makes it to the end and then you call down the three. Because when they start eliminating as they go, you kind of make a decision. It's the process of elimination. So it's always better when they were everybody because you didn't know where it was going to come from. So, yeah. I'm really curious about this. Knowing what happened before Miss USA 2015, what did make Brooke decide to step in as one of the last? Oh, that's a good question, Wilson. Good question. Um, Paula Shugart, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but she worked for the Hawaii pageant uh, people here when I brought the pageant to Hawaii. So she worked um, for the Hawaii contingency that helped bring Miss Universe here. So she didn't work for Miss Universe at the time. Um, and then from working with us at the Miss Universe uh, pageant when it was here in Hawaii, that introduced her to the world of the Miss Universe pageant and her husband, Carl Allison now, by the way. Um, and so that really sparked her into a whole nother career. If I don't win Miss Universe and bring the pageant to Hawaii, I don't know if Paula Sugar becomes the president of Miss Universe. So 
I think I had a lot to do with that. Um, but she put up the bat signal and was like, we need help. We need judges. Will you come? And I said, I'm on the next plane. Send me a ticket. So I know Omar, I, Pia and I had the same gown color. That's really kind of crazy. And the same age. She's gorgeous, by the way, and such a, such a wonderful human being. I haven't met her in person, but I know she's the pride pride of the Philippines. So he's back. Hi, I was <laughs> questions. No worries. You know, I, sorry, this is what, this is what I warned you earlier. No, no. So <laughs> I've been answering questions. Carlos <laughs> asking, do you like the continental setup on elimination? I'm not sure what continental setup on elimination means. No, no. In top 20 nowadays in Miss Universe, once you're yeah. called up for the semi fight, they're doing, they're doing it by continentally and wild cards. So, oh, I see, uh, I see, I see, I see. So they're allotting yeah. five slots per continent and then the last right. five for the wild cards. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I understand why they do it because they want to get a diverse, you know, amount of places represented because sometimes it's always the same contestants over and over and over again but on the other hand you know it's really about what the numbers are so if the top girls the strongest girls all happen to be from the same place then that's just the way the cookie crumbles but i see that they're trying to diversify and reach all the corners of the planet so it is kind of fair this is why brooklyn is the best we stand the spontaneous queen boop thank you omar i appreciate that Thank you so much. So, so now that we're talking about the present setup of, not that we are talking the present setup of Miss yeah. Universe. So, what do you think is the difference between back then when you were competing compared now, as to what's happening? Um, I honestly, to be quite honest, I don't think I could win in today's environment because the way that the matriculation of scores go down, you know, it's it's not when we did it. You wiped all of the you wiped the slate clean, and then it was based on your final answer. So. That's, you know, when you say you do everything twice, you kind of ante up and go all in. So, you know, it's just you swing for the fences, whereas now it's a matriculation. They don't base it on your final answer anymore. Um, so, yeah. Hi, I still, First time you saw your performance, but dang, she can still win even if she were to compete today. You're biased, but I'll take it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I beg to disagree. I think he will still win, even if you get to compete now. Because if you've, have you seen a recent Miss Universe edition? They're mostly interviews during the finals. Right. I think I'm yeah. telling you, sir, I'm telling you, 60%, 70% of the entire three hour show is right. mostly comprised of interviews. And right. if you're one girl whose strength is on interviews, right. And then you get to charm the judges with the way you with your ability to talk. Right. Right. You will be yeah. able to go further in the competition. Yeah. But you know, to be honest, here's the thing your years miss universe is spent talking a lot so if you are not comfortable doing that and it is not a strength of yours it will be a very difficult year because the way you look is important trust me um and it haunts you for the rest of your life trust me um but you know being able to speak in front of the un and you know presidents of countries and you know dignitaries is important and it is part of the job so i understand why they make the girls do them quite a bit and they judge them heavily on it because if you don't have that skill it is going to be a very very rough year and it's very difficult to learn on the job to do those things so i i, I understand why they do it for sure for sure so would you say that um would you say that because nowadays if you watch all these pageants like miss universe their girls are required to come up with an advocacy do you think it's oh i like to wow. I, I know this is <laughs> freaks you out oh my god wait no, so you're oh my god about, oh about the girls having to focus on some sort of an advocacy uh, yeah do you think you know do you think not pageants are becoming more politically correct politically correct because of this advocacy thing? I mean, I think it's the world itself is just, you know, you have to sort of reflect the times. The girls have always been advocacies for something. During my year, it was Special Olympics. Um, after that, you know, they, they did a lot with uh, World AIDS Awareness um, and those types of things, Miss Universe. So the company had always had some sort of a platform and a focus. I think now they're trying to let the girls have their own focus instead of having the girls bend towards their focus, which is great because if a girl has worked her entire career as Miss Tasmania or whatever, 
advocating for clean water all over the world, you know, it's kind of sad that she has to let that go when she's got the most power and now talk about something that she doesn't have a background in. So, you know, I think that Paula, them listening to where these girls are coming from and, you know, having them have some agency and ownership in that is, is a great thing because those girls can speak to it. It's something that they've di- put themselves in. Pia was a wonderful example of that. She did a lot of work in the Philippines and was an advocacy of that during her year. So, you know, to be able to use your platform for something that you were using before that platform was that big is monumental, you know, than having to set it aside and do something else. So I think all of them are really being sensitive to that. These girls have worked hard to get platforms. And so they should be able to continue to elevate that sort of um, message. So you think beauty pageants are evolving for the better? Or do you think should just... I mean, I think pageants are kind of, you know, I think in the realm of reality television, as we know it, between things like The Bachelor and The Voice, and I think pageants used to be the the reality shows of the past. And now it's very difficult for pageants, at least in my country. I mean, in other countries, it has a solid position because people there have rectified themselves to where it sits in their zeitgeist. But in the United States, it struggles because people here just don't resonate with the pageant um, Um, sort of format and where it fits in next to a Kardashian and, you know, all of the other things that are happening in the world. So I think it's got to go through some sort of uh, like reinventation in order to stay relevant, at least for America. I know in other countries, it's not a big deal. America is really the only country, and it's hard to say because I am of, of its ilk, sort of, even though some people think being from Hawaii or not, but we are, I assure you. Mr. Trump, we are part of the United States of America, Um, uh, (laughs) is that, you know, for us here, people still have a hard time rectifying that a girl can be beautiful and have be able to speak her mind and and be an astronaut and be all these things. We're in Venezuela, in, you know, South African countries, in the Philippines. They have no problems with a girl being beautiful and smart. No problem whatsoever. There, you don't need to be one or the other. The United States, for some reason, still can't seem to rectify themselves to the fact that a girl can run, walk across the stage in a swimsuit, wear a shiny thing on her head, and structure a sentence properly. Like to that, that just they can't they can't comprehend. You know, it's just mind boggling. So, it's a little off. It's a little weird here. We, we, yeah, yeah. I find it weird considering that you are the world's your country is the world's superpower. So in terms of technology thinking mindset, you're supposed to be, be also, more liberal. We also, we also made my Xbox the president. So yeah, there's no. <laughs> you, you really can't. There's nothing you can't explain it. It's really kind of strange. It's it's an odd. It's an odd bird. America, odd bird, very odd, very uh, odd. Ah, uh, okay. So, how do you feel? You know, up nowadays because of social media, a part yeah. a part of any girl's campaign as she competes for an international pageant is the use of social media. They post photo shoots, videos, videos, and their advocacies. Do you yeah. think a girl's social media following affects her chances of winning nowadays? No, I don't think it. I don't think the pageant even considers any of that in at all. I mean, I think the girls probably do because they're, you know, garnering as they go, because I'm sure, you know, people vote online, who's your favorite, wild cards, all of that. I think they bring that to the table, but I don't think Miss Universe cares because they know once that girl wins, she's going to get the following of all of the people that love the brand. Um, So they don't need help with getting the brand out. Miss Universe is a huge brand. Um, they just want to get the right girl and the right fit of a girl that's going to be able to do the job and do it to the best of their ability. So I don't think social media plays in so much. I think the girls probably make it a bigger deal than the pageant does. The pageant just is hoping that, you know, the girl is up for the job. But if she's from a tiny little country but blows everybody away on the stage, I mean, then she, that's just the way it's going to be. Miss Universe, like nobody ever believes me, and I always say this, even the judges, the girl who's supposed to win Miss Universe is the girl that wins. No one can explain how it happens, but, you know, it's some weird matriculation of cosmic tumblers that happen. Everyone, there are still people in Venezuela that are upset to this day that Morena was robbed and didn't win and that I was a waste of a Miss Universe experience. I personally don't feel that way. I mean, I had an amazing year. I took full advantage of it. It changed my life. I'm very proud of the fact that 20 something years later, people remember what I said more than they remember 
what I look like. And so that makes me incredibly proud. But, you know, people are always going to be subjective of what they think and who they think they should win. And, you know, it, it is what it is. I was the only Miss Universe to be uninvited from going to Miss Venezuela pageant, like in recent history at that point. So the minute that I won, Osmel was like, she can't come to Miss, Miss Venezuela. Oh, my I God. And I was like... Was I supposed to go? And they're like, yeah, Miss Universe has a standing invitation. She crowns in this Venezuela. I was like, okay, so I'm not going. Where am I going instead? You know, it's like, cool. <laughs> that opened up my schedule. Where to? Where should we go? <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I'm very lucky. I didn't take a lot of things personally. I still don't. Um, I just was like, I'm born and raised that way. I'm Korean. Like, we're tough people. Like, it just isn't. It rolls off for me, which is lucky. But I also didn't have social media. So that's the other thing. I was incredibly fortunate that I didn't have to see it every day. Like if yes, people yes. didn't like me, they had to get out a pen, write it on paper, put a stamp on it, put it in the mail, you know, and then maybe it would get to me because they would screen all of our mail anyway. So, you know, I didn't I didn't know what was going on most of the time until way later. So You know, we've been talking for more than an hour already. Have Can we I get really? <laughs>